Uh, if you guys are taking notes, the title of today's message is called The Last Ditch Effort. The Last Ditch Effort. Uh, back in December, of 18, uh, December 18th of 2022, just a few months ago, I preached a sermon titled Spiritual Amnesia, focusing on the utter blindness and forgetfulness of God's, faithful, uh, of God's faithfulness upon the lives of Israel. This seems to be a continual pattern throughout the history of the Israelites. From the time of Exodus, during their time in the wilderness, and even after they crossed over to the promised land in Canaan, people are quick to forget God's faithfulness in his provision, in his protection, especially when life circumstances do not pan out according to their heart's desire. Perhaps this is why many of us sitting in this room, perhaps this describes many of us sitting in this room as well. Where one day we spend time with our Lord in his word and in prayer, we feel so full, we feel so satisfied, perhaps even overwhelmed by God's amazing grace and his love for us. Yet just in a span of a few hours or even maybe a few minutes, you quickly forget those truths due to life circumstances not going our way. Maybe we get a phone call that one of our family members have recently been rushed to the hospital. Maybe we receive an email from our work notifying us that we have just been let go. Or maybe a letter comes in reminding us of the great financial debt that we are in. Whatever the issues, the cases, circumstances might be, more often than not, difficulties, hardships, and crises in life reveal to us just how deeply rooted or shallow our faith is in God. Just last week, at the end of chapter 26, we saw perhaps one of the apex or the pinnacle high moments of David's faith in God. Despite having King Saul placed right before him in the most vulnerable state, asleep. Despite all the, all the evil and the wickedness Saul had caused in David's life, David refused to lay a finger on Saul and spared Saul's life for the second time. David didn't take advantage of the situation. He didn't take revenge, because he, not because he was a coward. He did not kill Saul because he was afraid of the consequences. But he chose not to, because David did not see this battle as his to fight. But that it belonged to the Lord. Despite Saul's wickedness and evil, God was the one who anointed Saul to be the king of Israel. And although Saul had utterly failed to be the type of representative that God had hoped for, that still didn't give David the rights to take matters into his own hands to kill Saul. Although no one would have blamed David or seen David as a murderer for seeking vengeance from a worldly perspective, David chose to be merciful because he was able to see Saul from God's perspective rather than from the worldly perspective. Bravo, David. Bravo. But sadly... The story takes yet another drastic turn, as we see in today's passage, a completely different side of David. After sparing Saul's life, Saul acknowledges his foolishness, his wickedness, in seeking David's life and promises him that he will no longer do David any harm. However, David learned his lesson from before. Just outside the cave of Engedi, as he could not and would not trust any of Saul's words ever again. David knew from his past painful experiences that it would only be a matter of time before Saul's jealousy and hatred towards David overtakes him once again. And so David decides to do the unthinkable, right? And he makes a shocking decision to cross over to the dark side. What does that mean? You see, David was so sick and tired of Saul's relentless pursuit that the only way to make Saul stop was to go to the place where Saul was not welcome and considered an enemy. So David decides that his only hope, his only option, was to cross behind enemy lines to the land of the Philistines. Look at me in verse 1. Verse 1 says, Then David said in his heart, Now I shall perish one day by the hand of Saul. 
There's nothing better for me that I should escape to the land of the Philistines. Then Saul will despair of seeking me any longer within the borders of Israel, and I shall escape out of his hand. So David arose and went over, and he and six hundred other men who were with him to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. In verse 1, we see that the main motive that has led David into making such a decision was driven by his fear of Saul. From the look of things, David concluded that if he stays in Judah any longer, it was only going to be a matter of time before Saul and his men finally capture David. And so given David's circumstances, he concluded that there's no better option. There's no other option than to escape to the land of the Philistines to seek refuge. David's decision to seek asylum in the land of the Philistines was shocking, however, for two reasons. First, we see that this wasn't the first time that David tried to seek refuge in the land of the Philistines. David, do you not recall? Do you not remember the last time you were over there? If we see in verse 2 that they had decided to escape to the city of Gath, What was Gath known for? If you recall, Gath was Goliath's hometown. The mighty Philistine warrior that David took down just a while ago. To make matters worse, David was just there not too long ago. And it did not go well, to say the least. Although David tried to quietly cross over to Gath in an incognito mode, hoping that no one would notice him, he was immediately recognized, arrested, and brought before the king. The only reason David made it out alive was because David acted as if he was literally crazy, scraping the walls with his fingernails, drooling all over his beard. David, don't you remember? Immediately after you barely escaped from Gath, God has graciously and sovereignly led you to the cave of Adullam where you write Psalm 34, declaring that true refuge is only found in the Lord. This is what David wrote. If you read Psalm 34, that's what David wrote immediately after he escaped Gath the first time around. Friends, when crisis hits, it's not a matter of where you go to seek help, but who you go to to seek help. Sadly, despite writing such truths, David decides not to turn to God for refuge. Instead, he decides to turn to the Philistines. What's even more shocking is how unlike before when David tried to sneak his way into the Philistines, this time around he did not choose to stay stay hidden. He made his intentions very clear up front. Instead, he made a beeline to King Achish, hoping to collaborate with him, to partner with him, declaring that him and his men are now under his command. Even if it means that they have to fight against the Israelites, David and his men will be on King Achish's side. Friends, this was a big deal because David and his men had just fought against the Philistines not too long ago. In fact, David has up until this point has always been fighting against the Philistines because they were the arch enemies of Israel. Yet here, we see the very one who has been anointed and expected to be the next king of Israel, now crossing over to the dark side, joining forces with the Philistines, willingly choosing to live under the protection of the very enemies of Israel. What a tragedy indeed. Some say desperate times call for desperate measures, but David, not like this. What a disappointment. What a disaster. However, another shocking element to this story is perhaps what might, explain, uh, what might explain David's action was the fact that God is never mentioned in any of David's decision-making process in going over to the Philistines. Unlike before, when David would always get on his knees in prayer, pleading with God for his wisdom and his guidance, in today's passage, what's strange, what's fascinating is that we see no mention of David ever praying or crying out to God before making the decision to go over to the Philistines. Right? Such absence of prayer signifies how David's decision to flee Gath or flee to Gath 
was indeed driven by fear, not conviction and obedience. For David, his main motive was not obedience, but fear. For the first time, we see David is fearful of Saul. And to some extent, it's understandable. You got the most powerful man in Israel who has the whole nation at your command constantly chasing after you. We've been journeying through the book of 1 Samuel for some, for some time now. But did you guys know the amount of time that David has been living on the run as a fugitive was not a year or two? It was actually closer to 8 to 10 years. Some of us in this room are not even 8 years old. Right? Amen, Lydia? 8 to 10 years living as a fugitive. No home, nowhere to rest, always having to look, behind you, uh, look over your shoulders to see who's chasing after you. Friends, that's a very long time. And despite that many moments, uh, despite the many moments of deliverance, refuge, peace, and security that David had experienced when trusting in God, at this moment, we see that the only way, that from in David's comprehension, the only way to escape Saul was not running to God in prayer, but running to the Philistines. So what changed for David? Why did David choose to rely upon the Philistines rather than upon God himself? We see that unlike the past where David chose to focus on God's protection over him and not on his circumstances, here we see that David was overwhelmed by Saul, overwhelmed by his circumstances. We see a significant change in David's perspective from being God-centered to being self-centered, from being God-dependent to being self-dependent. When push comes to shove, the reason why David didn't pray and cry out to God, but instead fled to the Philistines, was because he feared Saul more than he trusted in God. He feared Saul more than he trusted in God. Rather than praying and crying out to God for help, David justified his decisions by blaming his circumstances. Blaming Saul's relentless pursuit being the major factor in him driving Uh, him driving him away from the presence of God, blaming Saul's persecution for his decision to cross behind enemy lines rather than his lack of dependence upon God, blaming the 600 men, count the women and the children, close to 2,000 people and their immediate needs rather than trusting in God's provision and protection. David was overwhelmed with fear, with doubt, And as a result, he was only able to see himself as the victim to it all, justifying all of his decisions, justifying all of his actions. Kind of like us today. Although David declared that there is no good for me in the land of of, uh, Israel, God had been reminding David from day one that he has been near, that he has been with David throughout his journey in the wilderness, that he is indeed the ultimate place of refuge, comfort, security, and peace. Not the Philistines, not anyone else, but God. Although David was accustomed to getting on his knees, always praying before making important life decisions. Sadly, in today's passage, we see no sight of David praying and pleading with God for deliverance. Instead, David decides to take matters into his own hands. And as a result of his unwise and foolish decision, we soon see the crushing consequences. Initially, when you look at verse 4, it appears as though things were looking up for David. It appears as though as soon as David crosses over to Gath, uh, things were going to be great for David and his people. As soon as they crossed over, they weren't arrested. As soon as they crossed over, they weren't put in prison. But what we see is King Achish seemed to like the idea of David and his men fighting for the Philistines. Can you imagine? If you are the king of the opponent and their best warrior brings 2,000 people to your land and say, we'll fight for you, even if it has to be against our own people. That's a great deal. What do I have to do in return? 
You see, the biggest sigh of relief for, for David was the fact that Saul had no longer pursued after them. I mean, he couldn't. In verse 4, we clearly see that. When it was told Saul that David had fled to Gath, he had no longer sought him. And from this point on until Saul ends up dying, which we'll see soon, Saul never ever chases after David again because he couldn't. He was behind enemy lines. So the biggest sigh of relief for David was the fact that Saul, after 10 years of running away, that was done. I mean, after 10 years living as a fugitive, this must have felt liberating. No more days of having to look over your shoulders. No more living a life constantly on the move. To sweeten the deal, we see in verse 6 that King Achish has agreed to give David and his people the land of Ziklag. Now, this is where they stayed for the next 16 months, right? One year and four months. At last, they had everything they needed, right? David and his men had food. They had shelter. They had safety from Saul's attack. Life was good, right? But in reality, things weren't all that great. You see, in order to live a trouble-free life in the land of the Philistines, David had to continually lie and deceive his way to King Achish. Although King Achish expected David and his men to now join forces with the Philistines against the Israelites, David had no desire to attack his own people. I mean, think about the consequences, right? He would never become the king of Israel if he had done so. This is why David specifically requests to be given the reins over the land of Ziklag. You see, to the south of the land of Ziklag lived several tribes who were actually enemies of both Israel and the Philistines. So David was being very strategic. So this gave David the perfect opportunity to raid their enemies, profit from their livestock, their garments, their belongings, and even deceive King Achish. Each time David and his men would successfully raid one tribe, they would not only take all the possessions for themselves, they would also offer some spoils of the war to King Achish. And whenever King Achish would ask, who did you raid this time? David would have to simply lie over and over again, saying it were the Israelites. Hey, who, where, where did you get all these livestock from? Oh, we attacked the Israelites again. What about this time, David? Who did you raid this time? Oh, it was the land of Judah, the Israelites. You see, it seemed like a win-win, right? Win-win situation. David and his men never go hungry. Akish thinks David is raiding against the Israelites. As long as David is okay with lying, as long as David keeps his mouth shut and continues to lie and deceive his way, life couldn't get better. However, our God is a God who loves David a little too much to simply allow David to keep living in this manner. You see, little by little, David was becoming an expert liar, a skillful deceiver, rather than a man after God's own heart. Rather than a man who fights on his knees in prayer, rather than a man who always prioritizes God's direction and call over his desires, here we see a man not fighting on his knees, but fighting with his sword, taking the lives of people, prioritizing his desires above all. During the entire 16 months of David's stay in Ziklag and in the land of Philistines, we see no sight of prayer, no sight of David crying out to God, no mention of David ever asking God for help, wisdom, guidance, direction. And so God, watching all of this, intervenes. Just when David thought life couldn't get any better, God provides a way for David to wake up and come to his senses. Look with me in chapter 28, verses 1 to 2. It says, In those days the Philistines gathered their forces for war to fight against who? The Israelites. And Akish said to David, understand that you and your men are, go, are to go out with me in the army. David said to Akish, very well, you shall know what your servant can do. 
Now, Keish said to David very well, I will make you my bodyguard for life. What David feared that could eventually become a possibility became a reality. If Saul's relentless pursuit is what David feared back in Israel, in the land of the Philistines, David was hoping that he never had to go against the Israelites. As long as he keeps quiet in Ziklag and continues to lie his way out of trouble, David was hoping to avoid fighting against the Israelites at all costs. And it seemed as though there was no way for David to lie, no way for David to deceive or slither his way out of this one. King Achish and the Philistines army were gathering first forces to go against Israel. They were about to go to war. And Achish expected David and his men to be his bodyguard for life, to put their lives, and their, li- uh, their lives on the line to protect their enemy and to fight for the Philistines, not for the Israelites. Man, can you just imagine the look on David's face, thinking about the different ways to get out of this one, but there was no other answer? How ar- ironic, isn't it? David, who has been anointed to be the king of Israel, is now having to lead an army against the very nation which God had commanded for him to lead, guide, and protect. From a worldly perspective, this is indeed a humiliating tragedy. David is getting what he deserves. Shame on you, David. But friends, if you take a step back and look look at this passage from God's perspective, how God sees this, this is yet another loving and gracious gesture, gesture from our God who doesn't allow David to continue living a life in sin and disobedience. Friends, our God is a God who is indeed the one who is behind all of this. Not to punish or destroy David, but to remind David once again of his call remind David of his identity, to remind David of his mission. You see, although David shunned God from his life for the past 16 months, God had never left David. Although David tried to distance himself from God, God had always been with David, not only in his victories, Not only in his obedience, but especially in his rebellion and his disobedience. And through this incident, God desired to remind David once again that he alone is a true place of refuge. That God alone is whom David ought to rely upon. Not upon the Philistines, not upon his lies and his deceits, not upon his clever tactics, but God and God alone. What then does this mean for us, friends? Likewise, I believe through, this, through passages like, uh, like this in Scripture, God desires to remind us of the same. For those of us who have been putting God at arm's length, like David, for some time, Maybe we were a little bit more passionate and devoted in youth group days, but now things got busy. He wants to remind you he has never left you. And there's nothing you can do to make him love you and care for you any less. Because his love for you is unconditional. In return, God desires for you to turn to him and to seek refuge. Peace, comfort, and security in God and God alone. So often, we like to pick and choose when we want or when we would want to involve God in our decision-making process. Right? Aren't we so good with that? We're so experts at that. Not this decision, God. I'll, I'll take care of this one. I'll let you handle the next one. You can be part of the decision-making process next time. Not, not this one. And the reason we do that, friends, is because we already know the answer, right? We already know the answer that God's going to give us. To be brutally honest, isn't that true? We already know that it's wrong. 
That's why we don't want God to be part of the decision-making process. We already know that it's not pleasing to the Lord. We already know that it is self-centered and self-exalting. We already know that our decisions are not pleasing to the Lord. And so just like David, we refuse to pray. And we just move forward with our decisions. God, I'll come back to you. Let me just have this one. And from the look of things, initially, it might actually appear to be the right decision. Things are going well. But if you're indeed a true child of God, if you are indeed God's beloved, i got good news for you. He will never allow you to simply ruin your life in that way. He will not leave you alone. Instead, he loves you too much to see you going down that direction. And so he allows circumstances to take place, to wake us up, to remind us, to warn us that our God sees everything. He knows everything and that he's not pleased. Knowing these truths about God shouldn't encourage us to run further and further away from him in our attempt to hide ourselves. That's what Adam and Eve tried to do, right, in the garden. Can you imagine trying to hide from God? Instead, his grace, his kindness, actually ought to lead us to repentance and to run towards God rather than away from him. Friends, let me ask you this morning, what are some of those fears and doubts in your own personal lives that are overwhelming us? even blinding us from seeing God for who he is. For some of us, it's financial struggles. For others, it's relational struggles. Whatever it might be, may today's message serve as a gracious warning to never allow our fears and our doubts to neglect our obedience, our conviction, and ultimately our allegiance to our God. Friends, rather than simply viewing God as our last resort, rather than viewing God as our last ditch effort, may we prioritize him as our ultimate, preferred measure above all. I pray that we will seek to rely upon God and God alone as our firm foundation and our ultimate place of refuge, our ultimate place of comfort, and our ultimate place of peace. Let's pray together.